Chapter 15. Over a dim, rocky road in a northeasterly direction, our buggy moved on. I noticed that the road stayed at the edge of the foothills, but always in sight of the river. About the middle of the afternoon, we stopped at a small stream to water the team. Papa asked Grandpa if he intended to go all the way to the campground before stopping. No, he said. I figure to put up for the night when we reach Bluebird Creek. With a good early start in the morning, we can make it to make the campgrounds in plenty of time to pitch our tent and set up camp. Late that evening, we reached Bluebird Creek. We didn't set up our tent. With a, lar with a tarp, we made a lean-to and built a large fire in front of it. While Grandpa fed and watered the team, Papa and I carried our bedding to the shelter and made down our beds. Grandpa said, while we're cooking supper, you see to your dogs. Feed them and fix them a warm bed. I figured to cook them some cornmeal and mu cornmeal mush, I said. That's what they're used to eating. Mush? Grandpa growled. They're not going to have mush, not if I can help it. He walked over to a grocery box, mumbling as he did. Mush. A hound can't hunt on a belly full of that stuff. He came back and handed me two large cans of corned beef hash, saying, Here, reckon they'll eat this. I started to hug my old grandpa's neck. Sure, grandpa, I said. They'll love that. Opening one of the cans, I dumped it out on a piece of bark in front of old Dan. He sniffed at it and refused to eat. I laughed, for I knew why. While I was opening the other can, Grandpa came over. What's the matter, he asked. Won't he eat it? Sure, Grandpa, I said. He'll eat, but not before little Ann gets her share. With the second can open, I fed her another piece of bark. Both of them started eating at the same time. With an astonished look on his face, Grandpa exclaimed, well, I'll be darned. I never saw anything like that. Well, I never saw a hound that wouldn't eat. Did you train them to do that? No, Grandpa, I said. They've always been that way. They won't take anything away from each other, and everything they do, they do it as one. Papa had overheard our conversation. He said, You think that's strange? You should have seen what I saw one day. One of the girls threw two cold biscuits out in the backyard to old Dan. He stood and looked at them for a bit, then, picking up both of them in his mouth, he trotted around the house. I followed to see what he was going to do. He walked up in front of the doghouse, laid them down, and growled. Not like he was mad. It was a strange kind of growl. Little Ann came out of the doghouse, and each of them ate a biscuit. Now I saw this with my own eyes. Believe me, those, two do those dogs are as close to each other. Real close. After Papa stopped talking, silence settled over the camp. Grandpa stood staring at my dogs. In a slow voice, as if he were picking his words, he said, You know, I've always felt there was something strange about those dogs. I don't know just what it is, and I can't exactly put my finger on it, yet I can feel it. Maybe it's just my imagination. I don't rightly know. Turning to my father, he said, Did you ever notice the way they watch this boy? They see every move he makes. Papa said, Yes, I've noticed a lot of things they've done. In fact, I would tell you a few if you would that you would never believe, but right now, here's something you had better believe. Supper is ready. While I was helping myself to hot Dutch oven cornbread, fried potatoes, and fresh side meat, Grandpa poured the coffee. Instead of the two cups I expected to see, he set out three and filled them to the brim with a strong black liquid. I had never been allowed to drink coffee at home, and I didn't exactly know what to do. I glanced at Papa. He seemed too busy with his eating to pay any attention to me. Taking the bull by the horns, I reached over and ran my finger through the cup's handle. I held my breath as I walked over and sat down by a post oak stump. Nothing was said. Grandpa and Papa paid no attention to what I did. My head swelled up as big as a number four wash tub. I thought, I'm not only big enough to help Papa with the farm, now I'm big enough to drink coffee. With supper over and the dishes washed, Grandpa said, well... We had better turn in, as I want to get an early start in the morning. Long after Grandpa and Papa had fallen asleep, I lay thinking of the big hunt. My thoughts were interrupted when the wonders of the nightlife began to stir in the silence around us. From a ridge on our right, a red fox started barking. He was curious and in his small way challenging the intruders that had dared to stop in his wild domain. From far back in the flinty hills, the monotonous call of a hoot owl floated down in the silent night. It was, the mating call, it was the mating call, and it was answered from a distant mountain. I could hear the stamping feet of our horses and the grinding, crunching noise made by their strong teeth as they ate the hard yellow kernels of corn in their feed boxes. A nighthawk screamed as he ring, winged his way through the starlit night. 
An eerie screech from a tree close by made shivers run up and down my spine. It was a screech owl. I didn't like to hear the small owl, for there was a superstition in the mountains concerning them. It was said that if you heard one owl, it meant nothing at all, but if you heard more than one, it meant bad luck. I lay and listened to the eerie twittering sound. It was coming from the left of our camp. The creepy noise stopped, and for several moments there was silence. When next I heard the cry, it was coming from the right. I sat up in alarm. Had I heard two owls? My movement had awakened Grandpa. In a sleepy voice, he asked, What's the matter? Can't you sleep? What are you sitting up like that for? Grandpa, I heard two screech owls, I said. Grunting and mumbling, he sat up. Rubbing the sleep from his eyes, he said, You heard two screech owls? Why, that's nothing. I've heard two. Oh, I see. You're thinking of the bad luck superstition. There's nothing to that. Nothing to do at all. Now you lie down and go to sleep. Tomorrow is going to be a big day. I tried hard to find a, to fall asleep, but I couldn't. I couldn't get the owls out of my mind. Had I really heard two? Were we going to have bad luck? Surely nothing bad could happen. Not on such a wonderful hunt. I found peace in my mind by telling myself that the owl had changed trees. Yes, that was it. He had simply flown out of one tree to another. The next morning, while having breakfast, Grandpa started kidding me about the screech owls. I wish you could have caught one of those owls last night, he said. We could have had boiled him in our coffee pot. I've heard there's nothing like strong hoot owl coffee. It wasn't a hoot owl, Grandpa, I said. It was a screech owl. I don't know for sure if I heard one or two. It could have been just one. Pointing at the small red oak, I said, I think the first time I heard him, he was over there. The next time it was over in that direction. Maybe he changed trees. I sure hope so. Grandpa saw I was bothered. You don't believe in that hogwash superstition, do you? Bad luck. Bah, there's nothing to it. Papa laughed and said, These mountains are full of that jig stuff. If a man believed it all, he'd go crazy. The encouraging words from Papa and Grandpa helped some, but there was still some doubt. It's hard for a young boy to completely forget things like that. Breakfast over and our gear stowed back in the buggy, we left Bluebird Creek. On that day, Grandpa drove a little faster than he had on a previous one. I was glad of this, for I was anxious to reach the campground. About noon, he stopped the team. I heard him ask Papa, Is this Black Fox Hollow? No, Papa said. This is Waterfall. Black Fox is the next one over. Why? Well, Grandpa said, There's supposed to be a white flag at the mouth of Black Fox. That's where we leave the road. The camp is in the river bottoms. By this time, I was so excited, I stood up in the buggy box so I could see, get a better view. Maybe you ought to step them up a little, Grandpa, I said. It's getting pretty late. Papa joined in with his loud laughter. You just take it easy, he said. We'll get there in plenty of time. Besides, these mares can't fly. I saw the flag first. There it is, Grandpa, I shouted. Where? he asked. Over there, see in the, on that grapevine. As we left the main road, I heard Papa say, Boy, look at all those tracks. Sure has been a lot of traveling on this road. That smoke over there must be coming from the camps, Grandpa said. When we came inside of the camp, I couldn't believe what I saw. I stared in amazement. There, I had never seen so many people at one gathering. Tents were spread out over an acre and a half of ground, all colors, shapes, and sizes. There were odd-looking cars, buggies, wagons, and saddle horses. I heard Grandpa say, almost in a whisper, I knew there'd be a lot of people here, but I never expected so many. I saw the astonished look on my father's face. Off to one side of the camp, under a large black gum tree, we set up our, our tent. I tied my dog to the buggy and fixed a nice bed for them under it. After everything was taken care of, I asked if I could look around the camp. Sure, Grandpa said. Go any place you want to go, only don't get anyone's way. I started walking through the large camp. Everyone was friendly. Once I heard a voice say, That's the boy who owns the two little red hounds. I've heard they're pretty good. If my head had gotten any bigger, I know it would have burst. I walked on as straight as a cane break came. I looked at the hounds. They were tied in pairs here and there. I had seen many coon hounds, but none that could equal these. There were red bones, blue ticks, walkers, and bloodhounds. I marveled at their beauty. All were spotlessly clean with slick and glossy coats. I saw the beautiful leather leashes and brass studded collars. I thought of my dogs. They were tied with small cotton ropes and had collars made from old check line leather. 
As I passed from one set of dogs to another, I couldn't help but wonder if I had a chance to win. I knew that in the veins of these hounds followed the purest breeded blood. No finer coon hounds could be found anywhere. They came from the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, the Bayou Country of Louisiana, the Red River Bottoms of Texas, and the Flinty Hills of the Ozarks. Walking back through the camp, I could feel the cold fingers of doubt squeezing my heart. One look at my dogs drove all doubt away. In the eyes of little Anne, it seemed I could read this message. Don't worry. Just wait. We'll show them. That night, Grandpa said, tomorrow they'll have a contest for the best-looking hound. Which one are you going to enter? 